somebody just reminded me of this the other day. Um, one, one of my partners on that, on that deal. Uh, um, at one point we were like, we'll give you a hundred dollars just to open the software. Like just open what it up and run it through, <laughs> like <laughs> walk somebody through it. Like, and we could not get them to do it. Live from the uh, Denver studio here, we got we got Alex Tiller. Hey, Raj. How are you? That's, that's awesome. Uh, so what's latest couple of weeks, a lot of travel for you? What's It feels like conference season is in full swing. Um, a little bit of travel, uh, a little bit of family time. Spring break, uh, uh, you know, had just has just uh, passed us up, so... Where does uh, yeah. a where does a man who has lived with his family in Hawaii go for spring break? Because that's that's really tough uh, to sort of beat. Uh, my daughter had the uh, the fun of going to Universal Studios and Disneyland this year. Look at that! So that that's uh, uh, fun for her. Maybe not as much fun for uh, for the parents. not as much. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But she likes it. <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and then uh, what? What else has been keeping you busy for the last few weeks? Anything from a uh, anything new? Anything shift recently? Um, I, I think you're you're right that um, you know it's it, it, we're we're kind of coming into conference season, um, uh, and so uh, fair amount of planning, getting ready for the year, uh, starting to execute um, what we, our year end planning uh, from. Uh, the, you know, really just starting to implement those things. Carbonvert um, has been focused on, and really our approach to the market has been to go project by project and do project level financings. Uh, and so we've been out with uh, kind of our two flagship projects, um, the Corpus Christi project uh, with Repsol, Mitsui, and POSCO. Uh, we've been uh, meeting with a lot of investors. Um, there's been a lot of interest in that. Uh, and then uh, simultaneously, we're also financing our uh, what we call our on-stream uh, project uh, portfolio, which is in Louisiana. Uh, so that's our, our partnership with Castex. We have uh, a, a large-scale uh, storage project uh, that's kind of the, the anchor uh, asset in that portfolio that we're, we're financing as well right now. So meeting with investors, um, lots of saying the same thing over and over and over and answering the same questions over and over and over. So maybe we answer uh, the top three questions you get on this podcast. So we just send it to them instead. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> see if they pass that would have been way them. more efficient. That would have <laughs> exactly. cut down my travel for sure. <laughs> yeah. I figured as much. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, I feel like Alex, you have a very fascinating background. Uh, and I, I don't like to flatter everyone. So I, I, I think it's just, from everyone I visit with an energy, I'd say, you know, like, and this is no slight to them, but the background is like, usually you do one thing and you do that very well for, let's say, 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah. You have a very interesting and diverse background relative to anybody else. So I'm going to take a stab at working okay. through the timeline that has been disclosed publicly. Okay. Because I appreciate as a serial entrepreneur, there's a bunch of things that are not listed. So I would right, love for you right. to fill in the blanks on some of the things that didn't work. Yeah, out. we don't we do we don't always talk about the ones that fail, right? I think it would be better if we did because uh, I, I think it would be pretty fascinating. So I'll take a stab at this. You okay. grew up, uh, you grew up in Ohio, sort of small town, uh, Corn Belt uh, sort of area. You, you and your brother sort of leave as soon as you can. You go to the Northeast. Uh, mm -hmm. You go to school in Boston, and then right. you sort of get into the financial world, starting in Fidelity. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like thereafter you had the urge to sort of go and start something new. And it felt like there was an inflection point around 3D animation, sort of <laughs> uh, post-dot-com you know, uh, era, and mm -hmm. got into that, which seems like you know, sort of a completely wild whirlwind from what we were probably going to talk about today. But that, that was sort of uh, uh, your first, what I see, public venture. You then sort of go, and it looks like a wilderness period around trying to start something new uh, in what is you know, sort of where your homeland is, which is focusing on sort of the corner belt, seeing if there was an ag-related opportunity. It seemed like there was a bunch of subsidies at that time you were trying to take advantage of. And yep. just while you were in that wilderness period, the market sort of went the other direction, didn't really make <laughs> a, a whole lot of sense. 
But while that was happening, it seemed like at least one of the investors stuck around and said, hey, why don't you go take a look at Hawaii? And that yeah. whatever that conversation was seemed to be perhaps the greatest conversation that ever happened because one, you got to move to Hawaii <laughs> and two, you took advantage of this phenomenal solar opportunity yeah. um, where you started with sort of tax equity and solar financing and then ultimately just acquired what appeared to be an EPC and development company. So you sort of wrapped those two things together and look like, you know, sort of hyper growth over four or five years, exited that business um, yeah. and, th and then moved what I see back to Denver, I guess, and uh, or to Denver and mm -hmm. started spending time back again in the tax equity world. And yeah. then it seems like there's a Genesis story around Carbonvert, uh, which has had a, a lot of milestones in a very short period of time. Um, yeah. And and so now we're here today. I want you to fill in the gaps on what what I missed. Because... I mean, it's pretty close, right? But yeah, there <laughs> there was definitely some stuff in in uh, in the middle there. I mean, that that first move, you know, all the way back to the my Fidelity investment days. Uh, you know, I was at Fidelity during the dot com boom, and so mm -hmm. everybody was having lots of fun um, doing startups and playing beer pong in their conference rooms and, uh, you know, all, all the silly things that, uh, that came with that day and age. I happen still to be happens today, by the way, Alex, you know, totally. like if you go to, <laughs> you go to any tech company today, even if it's a zombie code, they're still playing beer pong. Totally. Totally. The, uh, I was in the product group at Fidelity. I was in the product management group. And so we were putting brokerage technology on the internet for the first time. Uh, so I had this, I could see all the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial activity going on. I knew a little bit about technology. I could see a little bit about uh, you know gaps and things like that. Um, but you know, way back when I was in um, like middle school and high school, I, I I kind of liked art and wanted to be an artist. So wow. I had this like creative side, uh, and so I knew a fair amount of interesting uh, artists that were all better than me, quite frankly. I, it, it, you know, I had the creativity, but I just couldn't get it to come out of my <laughs> fingertips. Uh, and so um, somebody started showing me, and, and it, it's an interesting period of time. If you look back on this, this is right around when microprocessing, uh, you know, a, a standalone desktop computer uh, started to have enough power uh, to, to do some interesting things uh, and the, the appropriate 3D software uh, was starting to be developed and, and rolled out uh, in, in a, a, a platform that wasn't, you know, uh, something that was, um, you know, only Pixar's, you know, their own version of their own sure. software that only they could use, right? There, there, was, there was stuff that you could buy. And so um, that first move was a little bit about uh, being um, – kind of entrepreneurial and opportunistic. I saw a, a, a new technology. I knew a bunch of artists that were dabbling in this uh, um, uh, space, but they didn't really know business. They didn't mm -hmm. know how to write a business plan. They didn't know how to raise money. They didn't know how any of that stuff worked. And you were licking and, your chops saying, let, and, me, let me fix that for you guys. And, 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 and then I got my, my creative uh, um, fix out of, you know, being able to participate in the development of some of these uh, 3D animations and renderings and virtual environments. I mean, we were doing virtual environment stuff way back then that, um, you know, is, is now still pretty revolutionary, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so, so I think, and that might be a little bit of a theme, um, and, and to, to the way I think about things and also, you know, it wasn't the same mission that I'm on right now, but I had a little bit of a mission to, uh, be involved in the arts and, 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 um, I, I found, uh, a, a lot of motivation out of trying to help people that were very talented become something, express themselves, have, have a venue, uh, mm -hmm. to, to show their capabilities. And so that, that was my mission at the time. Um, uh, did that for a number of years and ultimately it was a lot of fun. I would call it a lifestyle business now at this point. Yep. Um, it, I could not figure out how to scale it, uh, because ultimately, uh, we would buy a quarter of a million dollars of, of, of servers. And, um, you know, about two months later, that would be 
basically Coffee, worth yeah. zero and then you could have just bought you know a couple uh, you know a, a handful of new machines instead of an entire rack of machines and i just like a, a bunch of money evaporated and, right and then we we needed more render power and more render power and so we we found ourselves in a in a interesting time but again uh fun work learned a lot uh that but but wasn't going to um turn into we had no aspirations to be Pixar. I, I, I don't know how to write movies. I don't know how to do – you got to do music. You got to do story. You got to do all these other things. And really, we were just kind of in the visual communications business at that point. Um, so ultimately, uh, handed that business off to the employees. Uh, it was an exit. It was my first exit. It was nothing exciting. Uh, what age were you at this point? 26? Something like good. that. 26, 27, good. something you got like fr- that. First taste, first. Uh, yeah, first yeah. There. Well, yeah. It, it, um, I'll have to go back and check the check the exact age on that. Uh, but then, yeah. So, uh, kind of look to now. What do I know? What else can I do? And um, having grown up in Ohio, knew a little bit about agriculture. Uh, grew up kind of out in the cornfields. Um, having, uh, worked at Fidelity in the product group, even though we were, uh, I was more on the technology product side, literally same floor, not too far away. The product guys that put together mutual funds and, 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 uh, fixed income products and things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, so, so knew a little bit about how funds worked, knew a little bit about, uh, agriculture. And so, um, and, and there was the renewable portfolio standard, um, was out and it was really kind of driving the ethanol business at the Mm -hmm. time. And so I like far, you know, thought farmland was a good investment. So worked on this, uh, farmland, U S farmland, uh, private equity, uh, fund concept, uh, idea was, you know, can I be a first time fund manager? Uh, can I get, uh, some big investors, uh, and, you know, had some interested parties, had a, had a, a, a few commitments of capital, um, but ultimately just could not get that thing to uh, uh, to go fast enough. And then we kind of banged into um, the downturn, Lehman Brothers yeah. going, you know, imploding and, and so forth. And just the, the, the market, um, it just killed. It basically killed all the momentum that we had. We 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 were um, building into it and, and uh, you know, we were going to go out and acquire a bunch of farmland and do different things with it to, to, uh, raise the value of the land, raise the income on the land. And what, one of the considerations was what can we do with wind, uh, primarily back Mm -hmm. then, but potentially solar looked like a a promising technology. Um, and it was unclear to us whether that would work in different States and how that, you know, how, how that was going to go. Uh, but spent enough time, uh, considering solar and thinking about it that, um, uh, that, that I knew enough to be dangerous. And so when, uh, and that, that company was called Agarco. And so Agarco uh, failed to launch. Uh, one of the early investors um, had this, uh, had grown up in Hawaii. Um, and, and uh, you know, we were talking about what I was going to do next. And uh, I brought up, you know, this solar and wind stuff is pretty interesting. And uh, I might kick around in that and try to fi- try to find some opportunity. Uh, and, and this guy said, Hey man, you, you should look at Hawaii and then come back to me and tell me if, uh, if, if there's something interesting there for you. So that's kind of uh, fascinating, you know, like yeah. you, you went back home, said, let me try to find something to, to do in Ohio. Didn't really pan out. He goes, Hey, I grew up in Hawaii. Why don't you check Hawaii? Well, out? I, so, gonna- so I had, I had moved car. I, I had moved artist rendering from, from Boston where I started it right. to Denver. There was a there was a lifestyle move there. I I like to ski. There was a bunch of universities that were graduating animators that um, didn't, and then everybody kind of had to move to California. Creatives in Denver too, right? Like uh, you're gonna find you're gonna find some interesting guys that are gonna work on that side. Yeah. So I was able to staff. So anyway, so I was living in Denver at the time. So so uh, um, yeah. In hindsight, started the the agri uh, the farmland fund. Do you uh, think the failure to launch might have been a good thing in hindsight, because imagine if this is sort of, let's say you, it did pan out. Let's say mm-hmm. you end up being a GP, you raise some fund that has a 10 year fund life focused on ag uh, during yeah. that era. I'm not sure it would have been as profitable as going and chasing the venture you sort of did. 
every, every, almost every bad thing. I, I would almost, I would go so far as to say every negative event that I've had so far in my career that I thought was negative at the time has turned out to be okay and maybe even a good thing. So, yeah, yeah I mean, a, a little bit of a blessing in disguise. It certainly didn't feel that way at the time. There was sure. a lot of frustration and had spent a lot of time and and people's money, uh, you know, getting get, getting set up and getting moving and then. Uh, to feel like you kind of get your legs taken out from under you from, uh, you know, other events around the world that 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 um, uh, that doesn't feel good at the time, but it certainly played out, played out pretty yeah, well for a, me. Yeah, it's it's tough, right? Like, uh, you know, mar- market selection is interesting because um, I forget who I'm sort of copying this from, but you know, like I did not come up with this. Is you can have ten out of ten execution on mm-hmm. what the market perceives as a two out of ten opportunity. Right. <laughs> and that is, in some ways, a waste of everybody's time, right? Yep. Which is, yep. you know, you're probably better suited to pick, let's say, an 8 out of 10 opportunity. And even if your execution isn't as great, you're, you're still going to be better off and you're going to create a lot more value, which is, which is kind of wild to think about. But uh, It's true. That's true. So you That's end up really moving to Hawaii. There's, again, it looks like, I don't know if this is you know, sort, sort of intentional on your part. It looks like you're sort of, uh, framework, let's let's say, for lack of a better word, uh, for some of these businesses, is there is some inflection point in the market that leads you to say, hey, this is a growing trend. So, yep, the animation one was around technology a little bit. Uh, the the farmland was was sort of related to sort of tax code and subsidy. Seems like the same thing, sort of, on your Hawaii thesis. Yeah, I think you kind of have to look at these. Uh the broader market opportunities against what you know in life and, and um, just constantly kind of be scanning the horizon for opportunity. That's um, you can't be so distracted by that, that you can't get anything done uh, in between now and whatever in the future. But um, I, I I would say that I tend to watch trends and and think about things and, and try to look for those opportunities. The, the, the back to the animation thing. So it was, the right technology. There was I, I knew the right people, but it was also uh, post nine eleven. There was a real estate boom, and so mm. a lot of what we were doing, the the business niche that we found, uh, the the opening in the market was for all the the real estate development that was going to happen, right? And so all these condo buildings were going up in Miami, and you know people were built, developers were building new neighborhoods and housing, like. And so, so that it, it was, it was the technology hitting the right point. Plus, the market was being driven to try to communicate. They wanted to sell stuff before it was built, right? right. And, and and so, There's and we were able to deliver right. that that solution, uh, and that gave these animators work that they could do and interesting right. work and um, uh, and challenge themselves on that, and it and it could pay the bills. So, uh, and then with this. Um, with farmland, you're right. It was uh, kind of RPS and, um, and 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 so renewable portfolio standard uh, was driving a number of things, and then certainly solar. The 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 solar one is a little bit interesting though. I mean, you got to call a spade a spade. Like I got lucky with my timing on that. Yeah, uh, I, I had no idea what was about to happen in the market. Uh, I knew that the fundamentals were right. Like. So Hawaii was and remains the best place in America to build a, a renewable energy project. They have the highest cost of power in the country. Uh, they have these uh, relatively small grids, but but they're very well known. Mm-hmm. Uh, the islands aren't interconnected. They burn. Uh, they still burn uh, a, a fair amount of oil. Uh, so their their utility uh, power was really subject to to mm-hmm. uh, global oil prices. And would move up and down, and generally was very, very high. Uh, but when you, um, you know, went to actually uh, pro forma a project and 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 work on it, if you sold, uh, you know, green electrons to somebody through a solar system, um, you know, you you could lock them in on a rate uh, that was the same, a same rate, a fixed price because there's uh, a fixed cost here, and you're not subject to to, to global oil prices. Um, and, and, um, you know, and that rate, what, what was normal to them was pretty high in the market. Uh, and and so you, you get, uh, rapid paybacks on these, on these projects. 
uh, rapid pay, uh, cash on cash uh, kind of returns. Um, and, and, you know, you throw in things like depreciation and, and tax credits and all these other things. Uh, it, it really got interesting. The state of it was Hawaii a unique situation where you yeah. take a commodity business or what, what you would perceive as a commodity business, but there's yeah. a lot more margin than ordinarily there would be, uh, g- given the timing, right? Like the alternative is way worse because of the volatility. You can lock in much higher margin than historically you could because they were dealing with such a, uh, a bad alternative, and then lock in you know what seems to be federal plus state level uh, sort of that's tax right. credits, uh, and that's it's just right. like a gravy train, right? Like there, it, there were so so you look at it. There was a thirty percent federal tax credit. There was a thirty five at the time. It's gone now. Thirty five percent state tax credit. Sixty five percent of the project cost is paid for by it's somebody else. Yeah, yeah, right. And then the balance of that, you're 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 paying off against the the the. Um, you know the the normal cost of power uh, within within the state, which is already astronomically high relative to to the rest of the country. Um, it, it was really an exciting time, and it was a different. Um, it was a you know you kind of had to um, approach things different. Um, we didn't know that the price compression was going to happen within the, mm-hmm. the cost compression was going to happen within the market. Um, and so, uh, for for those of your viewers that don't know, basically. Right about when I entered that, the time that I entered that business, so be thinking 2008, 2009 timeframe, uh, the cost of solar manufacturing, buying the panels, buying all the uh, balance of system, buying the inverters, all the stuff that goes into a, a, a solar system um, basically went down like 80 or 90 percent over wow. the next handful of years. It, the, they'll say a decade, but most of that happened in the first few years. So in the wow. The, and 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 and, um, and so that was a, an exciting uh, trend to to move into, but it also kind of yeah. created its own uh, technical problems because you know you would deploy one megawatt uh, one month or or whatever it is, uh, and and then the cost had come down so much that the next month you would have to deploy two megawatts to make the same margin because uh, you know, there were other competitors in the market and there were other people going after it, riding that trend down. And so uh, it it was uh, like, you really had to feed the beast and and increase your volumes to get your, uh, you know, your, your margin is your margin, but your fixed costs remain the same. And so it kind of diminished as the cost came down and as competition ate into that. So uh, it was, it was, it was fun. It was, it was hard. Um, but uh, we did some innovative things. We were one of the first groups that went out and really focused on uh, financing uh, renewable energy systems and targeting um, uh, nonprofits. So the nonprofit organizations could not take advantage of the federal or the state tax credit. Uh, but these are the types of organizations that were interested in, one, fixing their costs, uh, right. and two, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, kind of the the green side of things. So to be churches, it would be schools, it would be um, non probably think Red Cross of Hawaii, you know, those types of groups uh, were very interested in in getting solar systems put in and 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 limiting uh, the the just astronomical nosebleed uh, cost of power that that just was on a forever climb and has continued to climb. Um, and, and so we would go in and actually own the system for them. We would pay for it, uh, and, and, and own and operate that and just sell them the power. Right. And right. so, and that's pretty normal today. Uh, you'll see, you see Sunrun and yeah, yeah, yeah. you see Senova doing it on the residential side. And you know, there's, uh, you know, numerous groups now that have, uh, have kind of picked up the lead on that and, and gone after that. But, uh, I do think we were probably one of the first, uh, to, 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 to introduce that concept and to own those assets. It seemed like you identified a niche, you know, sort of similar to your 3d animation example, which is here's a niche that like, seems like a very niche market, but that's the perfect customer for us. Right. So instead of chasing all sorts of opportunity set, it was, Hey, we got this tax credit expertise. Yep. Most other people don't. Right. So we'll just go to the person who is most desperate for assistance on that tax credit problem, which in this example is, you know, nonprofit, which makes you, them the best customer, right? Which is, um, yeah. they don't normally have access to this. You're a provider who can solve that problem. Yeah, the 3D animation is probably a fascinating example, which is everyone else is creating art for art's sake, 
uh, and you're like, hey, let's, you know, let, let's not approach it that way. You can create your art, but we're going to have to do it for some business purpose. Who needs uh, it? Yeah. yeah, who needs it? Who is most desperate for my services is probably your first yeah. layer of customers. And then you can sort of expand off of that. But, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, without a customer, you sort of don't really have a business, right? So. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the one, and I would tweak a little bit of uh, the kind of the, the the narrative that you gave on um me joining uh, the solar business in Hawaii. You know, I, I came out with equity and tax equity to invest. Uh, Sunetric, which was the company's name, already mm-hmm. existed. Uh, a guy named uh, Sean, had, uh, Sean Mullen had started the company and was already, um, he was an electrician, bright guy, super smart guy um, that and had built a business, um, but um, really didn't, I think it was the scaling, how do you scale it? And so first we came with capital and we teamed up with those guys uh, to help finance. Oh, he, he just wanted to do build a project for you, right? He, he was, was like selling. EPC, right? he, was, yeah. he, he was an APC. He wanted to build a project for you. And, um, and, 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 um, and then so our ability to come in and unlock deals like the nonprofits uh, through, you know, having uh, capital uh, helped, helped his business. And, and then uh, ultimately him and I got along very well. He asked me to come in and, um, and help kind of take the business to the next level. Um, and, and so, so I stepped in as CEO and I bought a piece of the company and, and, um, and, and so forth. So we were really doing it all. We were doing, yeah. we would sell it to you. We would, uh, uh, we'd build it. Uh, we built for other developers uh, we, uh, we built everything from utility scale projects all the way down to residential rooftop. And we did a lot of this CNI, uh, commercial and industrial scale stuff, um, for, for whether it was, you know, again, directly for that customer in the end, it could be a car dealership or something. They were properly capitalized. They could take advantage of it. Great. Uh, and if not, then, you know, we would, it, it was a, it was an interesting value proposition. Cause you'd say, right. here's what it costs to do it. And if you don't want to pay for it, I'll pay for it. And right. here's how much you would pay for the the energy, right? And 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 we won all the way through that um, through that offering, right? Do you think you take that same analogy really from from a CCS perspective as well? Do you think you know now, now that you've looked at the entire value chain the way you did it, call it in in this solar example? What are the elements that you think work well for call it a smaller pure play developer here on the CCS side? That makes sense. Obviously, a much bigger boy game far more, yeah. you know, larger CapEx, but what do you think's relevant? What do you think's not relevant? Um, I think that y- we need to get to a full service solution. Like if you don't want to pay for it, we'll, we'll pay for it and we'll just buy the carbon from you. Right. right. And uh, that, that has not been fully worked out yet. Right. Um, there's a handful of, uh, um, deals in the market that may look like that. Um, but, but there's not an established market norm around that, but it is, it, it, it will go that way someday. Um, the, the nuance here or the tricky part is that, uh, most of the large emitters, uh, don't want somebody coming in and monkeying around with the equipment on their systems, uh, putting capture equipment in that may or may not, um, you know, impact the performance of, of their multi-billion dollar refiner, sure. right? Um, and so so that is a little bit of a challenge in that uh, I think you need a little bit more, these are large sophisticated organizations that are gonna wanna have a say over what technology and who the, you know, who's building it and how it operates and whatever. But ultimately I don't think that they want to own it um, and own that, that equipment. Um, and, you know, that sets up a scenario where uh, somebody like uh, a carbon vert could come in and partner with an emitter and say, um, you know, you've already spec this out. Um, we're going to be your transportation and storage option. Right. We, we would, we would also be happy to own your capture equipment. We'll take, um, or, or not, or you can own it. Yeah, um, or you can and, and, it or something. Yeah. There's right. Something and, but, but, but ultimately we'll, we'll take the full stream of the tax credits and, and any carbon offsets, if there's any of those, and we'll pay you instead of you having to go out and engineer it, operate it, change, you know, transfer tax credits and carbon offsets, like maximize that, and then just pay a fee to 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 somebody to be a, in the disposal service. Right. You can do that, but 
most of these organizations eventually get to a point. What we've found is uh, in their their learning the arc of their learning about decarbonization. In the beginning, they always think they can do it all, and they'll even be looking at subsurface and drilling their own wells yep. and, and thinking about subsurface. And eventually, that gets cut back, and then they they start thinking about uh, to 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 get a pipeline to to get this to somewhere. I don't I don't really want to be in that. And the, but the engineers will, will work the technical, and they can come up with the solution, and they always go. Yeah, yeah, of course our tax our tax department has got this. They you know, they're they're really focused on like how do we do it and the doing, but not like the whole wrap of like how do you actually right. make the revenue model work, lay off the risk, separate yourself from the stuff that you don't like you're not normally this isn't their core business, right? And so after various amounts of time of people saying we've got this, we'll you know, whatever. Uh, the phone sends, tends to ring and they say, hey, you know what? We'd actually like you right. to come in and uh, take a look at what we're thinking and uh, and maybe let us know, you know, if you took this over, um, how we could simplify this. Because right. these the investment committees, boards of directors, these are these are high capex projects, as you mentioned yep. earlier. Uh, these are oftentimes uh, for, for the large organization, certainly uh, starts with a B, right? Billion, billion right. dollar projects in many cases. And uh, those folks, um, it's it's hard to get these complex to take the complex story of what really goes into a project into an investment committee or a board of directors to try to get approval. And they see all these w weird things that have to be strung together that the company has no expertise or no history in doing. They, they tend to um, not like that and, and, it's and not think it's successful. required and uh, you know, the upside is minimal, but you know, so on your point on the, uh, you know, the evolution, I think that's right. I, um, I have not met a group of engineers uh, that ever leave the meeting saying we couldn't do that ourselves. So that is like just a universal, that's not a, sure. that's not yeah. a bug. That's a feature of an engineering team, which totally. is like, we don't need these people. We could do it ourselves. The problem totally. is uh, that's not, you know, their incentives aren't aligned to that. You know, said another way, if you, if they hire carbon Verge or someone like you and yeah. you don't perform over two years, you get fired. Yeah. If the engineering team doesn't make progress in two years, you know, it doesn't really matter because that's not their core part of their business, right? They've got other stuff they've got to do. It's a specialty project for them, Correct. right? Like th this is not what, yeah, yeah, that's so, right. So the incentives are, are, are not aligned there in terms of employment around actually executing all what needs to be done. Uh, and so that generates a little bit of a problem. But you know, that it, it starts with the question though, right? Engineers love to start with the question, can we do it? Right. And they don't always start with the question, should we do should it? We do? And right, how exactly. would we do it? And then if, if we should, how? Yeah. Like that's different. that's very different than can. Like we can we can prove lots of stuff on paper. I and I've made this mistake in the past. So you, you asked me to share some of the mistakes. I mean at, so I sold uh Synetric, um uh in 2014 okay. and we had a um a, a business inside the, the it was an idea that i had uh come up with um uh and we, we called it auto watts right and the 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 idea was i was trying to figure out how you could sell solar in the u.s to homeowners uh and 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 make what was happening in hawaii how do we replicate that over to to the mainland right yeah um, and, and, and the thing that the mainland U S they, they have different, uh, power sources for, um, uh, well, th they have, uh, different feedstocks for their, for, for power, right? So you got coal, you got natural mm -hmm. gas, right? And they're not burning bunker fuel oil, right. uh, but, but, but everybody drives a car and that that's all on the same thing. And so these, uh, electric vehicles were just starting to come out. And so I kind of came up with this hypothesis that. It, you want to be able to show a good financial projection, like a, a return on investment. And so if, if we can make people think about like the, the, the thing in common is, 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 is oil. And if we can, if we can say, okay, let's sell a solar system with an electric vehicle and let's package it. Like you're selling a car. Imagine if you went and bought a gasoline powered car at the dealership and you could prepay, 20 grand today of your gas a, 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 of your gas. And then you never have to pay for any more gas. 
Right. Right. The rest, the rest of the life of the vehicle. Right. Cause it pays itself off and then it's gone. Right. Yeah. And, and then, and that also had that, the, the, the economic fundamentals uh, now you're fighting the cost of gas instead of the cost of grid power necessarily right. you'd size the system to the, to the driving profile of the person. You could do it all in the finance office. Th- this was the idea, right? You do it in the right. F and I office at the dealership. They love to sell extra stuff. Yeah, Why so wouldn't they? they? <laughs> right. Right. And so, so that was the idea. And we started to build uh, software to, to support that. We decided that there's no way that uh, the technical uh, sell, uh, piece of, of, of pricing a system, um, you, you, we, we basically had to build s- special software that would do it all because you can't teach car dealership, yeah, car yeah, dealership yeah, yeah, yeah. people yeah, yeah. all this yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, was, but, but so we spent all this time building this software because I, I, was, I was sold out like – and. <laughs> that, that, that this was the right way to do it. And this was going to be huge. And you look at all the, you know, how many electric cars are going to be made and what's going to be the conversion rate on that and so forth. Um, and, and by the way, so I, I was doing this within uh, Synetric. And when I sold Synetric, we peeled off, we said, you don't get auto watts. And so see, this was one of the first things that I, I started working on uh, after selling uh, uh, Synetric. And, um, but the problem was we, we spent, we did the, can you do it? Cause I was like, I don't know if we can do, build the software right. and make it so smooth and make the, and make it accurate and set up the distri- distribution network that we're going to need to do. And so I spent a bunch of work on the time of, can you get the LIDAR data that you need so that you can read the homeowner's roof and can we infer and, and, and can we, you know, all these things, can you, instead of should you, or, or, and, yeah. and how would you do it? Right. And so built this slick software uh, platform, uh, went to roll it out. We, we rolled it out. We got a couple of dealer, a handful of dealerships in uh, the Bay Area. That was where the highest penetration in the sure. country uh, for electric vehicle adoption was happening. And the whole thing like imploded on itself because what, what we found out was that the F&I, the finance, the F&I guy, yeah. the, the, the person in the finance and insurance office that closed like – You've already said yes to the deal, and then you got to go in and do all that paperwork. Yeah. And then they sell you extended warranties and floor mats and all these other things. They didn't want to sell it, no matter <laughs> what. Like they hated even, even it. Even with larger commissions, they just didn't want to sell it. They did. It, we at one point, somebody just reminded me of this the other day. Um, one, one of my partners on that on that deal. Uh, um, at one point, we were like, "We'll give you a hundred dollars just to open the software." Like, just open it up and run it through, (laughs) like, (laughs) walk somebody through it, like, and we could not get them to do it to save our... Was the thought it was too difficult to sell or, like, it was just going to, you know, booger up the conversation? What was the thought? So so here's what it was. One, they're very used to selling on a pattern. They start with the insurance and the warranty and, you know, this fear-mongering. Here's your monthly, you know, yeah. Yeah, and we'll just roll it in and it's only 13 more dollars. They know how to sell that all day long. They've been trained. And and so they're going to go with what they know and what earns them the biggest commissions. And then it, it's this descending sales pattern and anything new gets stuck at the end. And then there's like a uh, buyer fatigue at the end. Right. Yeah. It's right. Complex. And so they just did not want to. And then, so that was, that was one kind of uh, finding. And then the other was that um, they were scared to look dumb. Right. They didn't, right. they really didn't understand it. So, so even though we built this software that could do all the things and played it, played a video, plays an info video, like we'll, yeah. they don't have to say the sales pitch. We'll, we'll play the, the sales pitch for them. Then somebody would be like, well, what happens if the power goes out in my neighborhood? And they're like, I don't yeah. know, right? And they didn't, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. they didn't want to lose their credibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's funny. I mean, again, it's maybe a 10 out of 10 execution on what was ultimately a 2 out of 10 opportunity there, right? Like, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, so and the timing was off. Like, uh, I, I still kind of, I mean, if you go to go to buy a now. Tesla today, they're they're selling solar panels in the Tesla dealership, right? Yeah, roll it all and, into a monthly. Why not? Yeah, you know, let, it, let's figure it out. It, um, it's it, it's it, it's different. Um, but we no, learn, no, no, we no, learn no. these lessons. And, like being early is the same as being wrong, unfortunately, on, on these sorts of things. I've right? been early. I've been too early a few <laughs> times. That'll that'll that's hard. So, so what was um, 
you, you mentioned sort of moving over and looking at this on, on the CCS side. What was, is there a romantic Genesis story here or was it, hey, like, let's take a look at this. Maybe there's a business opportunity. What, what was sort of the origin story? Of me getting into CCS. Right. Um, so, uh, okay. So sold Sinatric, did Autowatts. That didn't work out. Um, kind of kicked around in the solar space um, uh, a little bit. And um, there, worked, um, ultimately ended up at this, uh, there was a tax equity shop. They're, they're a fund sponsor. Mm-hmm. Um uh, based out of San Francisco, and really they had primarily been in the real estate tax equity business in the past. They'd done a little bit of some solar deals here and there, mm-hmm. um, but but primarily they were doing like low income housing tax credits and and a lot of historic preservation tax credits. So they were they were real estate folks. Very lucrative business, by the way. <laughs> Very lucrative. I mean, great business and and, and you know uh, good brand, good yeah. reputation in the business. But they they had decided that they wanted to really build out an energy practice. And so uh, uh, we got connected up um, and I said, you know, I I know a little bit about funds and I know a little bit about tax equity and I know a little bit about standing up a business. Um, And and so uh, and I know a little bit about talking to investors. And so uh, ultimately stepped in uh, to that organization to build out their to build their renewable energy uh, practice of uh, tax credit business. And so, um, so was doing that and, and that was kind of its own cycle of, you know, first it was just me and you build the investment thesis mm-hmm. and put together fund docs and, uh, you know, kind of like build a marketing plan and then you start to market this thing and start to try to raise money. Marketing is, is raising money. Yep. Uh, in the beginning, you got to raise money before you can go, you know, invest in projects. And so uh, built, built the sales funnel there started to build, like started to raise some money, started to raise, uh, th- then you need the ability to, to deploy it. So started to hire some team. Um, anyway, so was doing that and that was, uh, for several years and that was great. It was a, it's a, a good business. Uh, it's a lucrative business. It's a needed business. Um, uh, but it, it wasn't particularly innovative, uh, mm-hmm. if, if, if you ask me. Um, and so, uh, but that's okay. Uh, er- er- everything you do can't, you know, be crazy and novel and first, first time risk on everything. Right. So, uh, it was, uh, it, it was, it was a good business to be in. Uh, but I was doing that. Um, and, and in February of 2018, the, the 45 Q tax credit revision came out. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I had never seen 45 Q before. It was shocking to me that yeah. that even existed previously. I didn't really know what carbon capture and storage was. I was very much electron focused and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe some tax credits for some bio digesters, you know, but, but, but for the most part, it was like solar, almost all solar, a little bit of wind, a little bit of fuel cell here and there. Um, and, but, and so this thing was, uh, this tax credit was interesting uh, to me. And it was, uh, interesting to one of our institutional investors that we, uh, talked with, uh, uh, and spent time with a lot. Um, and, and so started digging in on it and really spent a couple of years going to conferences, trying to house the technology were really technical conferences. Um, and what was really interesting was there was all these people that knew how to do it, but they did, there was no, there was no finance guys in the room. There was, there, it was all geologists. Yep. It was, it was, um, all, that all the, the, dis- the t- of EOR, right? Like it was really, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, decades or, of these or, or it was these academic people yeah. or, or DOE funded academic people. Right. So maybe yeah. not universities, but D- the DOE had been pouring, uh, yeah. billions of dollars yeah. into, into getting, you know, and there were these carbon safe programs and you're like, Oh, <laughs> There's this whole world, you know, it's not that big, but there's a universe of people that actually know how to do this. Uh, but there was still just no, no deal guys in the room. Yeah. And, and that was weird. Uh, so it was like, okay, you've, you've well, story before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, huh, everybody's saying this stuff's really expensive. Like everybody told me when I went and got into solar, they were like, that's never going to work. And it was like, well, maybe it works somewhere. Like not, yeah, maybe yeah. not everywhere, but maybe somewhere. Right. right. And maybe if 
these things happen, maybe that changes over time, right? right? And and yep. so, um, so that was exciting, and and it seemed like um, I was I was still wearing my my uh, tax equity fund manager hat, and I was looking for projects to invest tax equity, equity, any like where's yep. the deals? Right. And there were just no deals. And I spent two years. And so ultimately, kind of in the end, the, it was like somebody needs to go make put together some projects. Right. Uh, because and it was only fifty dollars a ton at the time uh, for sequestration. But there were places where that worked. Mm -hmm. And you're like, it's not everywhere. You have to look for it. You have. Uh, but under certain circumstances, that worked. And so it seemed to me and everybody was really interested in ethanol because the, the people that were thinking about projects and where projects might happen. And a lot of that was the vendors, the vendors, the, the, the people that wanted to do the technical work to build a, to put together the project. Um, they, they wanted ethanol. They, they were smart enough about how things work that they were focused on the ethanol market. Cause you know, it's low capture, almost zero capture costs, low, low really, capture. really yeah. low. Yeah. Um, but that, that in itself, like everybody was kind of all spun up about ethanol and, it was like, well, I mean, that's that's interesting, but these, having grown up in the Midwest and grown up in the cornfields, yep. like these things are not close to each other, yeah, right? And these, and 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 um, and so, and then we were kind of, it was COVID time, right? And right. so, and then it was like, you know, some of these plants are shutting down. Like, this is not the place to do it. Yeah, ethanol right? is a one uh, X business in the sense of like you're lucky to get your money back, right? It's not a, right. uh, it's not right. high returning business. Yeah, I mean, so uh, and and yeah, granted, you could sell it for more into California. Like there was a reason why people were focused. carbon fuel standard at that. It time. wasn't. It wasn't like the, the, it was dumb people. It was just that everybody kind of glommed onto one thing, and we. Right. Um, so anyway, so ultimately, the uh, it's like all right, got to somebody needs to start something, and then the question was, I, I felt I almost felt compelled. I was a little bit beat up. There there had been another startup, which I don't even feel like going into, but. Uh, there, there had been another startup on the side where I was just a board member, but that, that had been a catastrophe. And so, uh, I had kind of sworn off startups for a little bit, but then I saw this like need, there was a gap. I felt like I know, I, I understood the technology some, uh, I felt like I understood the financials, like the, like the, the revenue model really well. I felt like I, I had been talking to investors. I felt like there was appetite in the market. Mm -hmm. I, I, I put together a development, like at Sunetric, we had a development company. We were developing our own stuff. So I, I felt like I knew a lot of the pieces, uh, but I didn't actually know how to, like wiring together some, some solar panels is stupid simple. And any dumb dumb can do that. And this was actually really technical. So yeah. it was like, okay, I don't want to do another startup, but I feel almost compelled that something needs to be done here to, to start this market. Um, and, and I guess, I, I guess I kind of got to do that. And then the question was like, can I find somebody that, that, uh, to, to start with that actually knows how to do these projects that, right. that isn't just like, I'm a little bit, I'll self-admit I'm a little bit of the hand waver, right? Like I can sure. explain stuff, but like the sitting down and actually engineering it and saying, this is how it's going to come together and this is what it's going to cost. And this is the time it's going to take. And here's the risk associated with that. Um, that's not me, right? That's, that's not what my profession is or what uh, kind of the, the, what I am uh, in, in business. That's not my role. And so uh, I was super lucky to find this woman, Jan Sherman that had just uh, retired from shell and she was general manager of carbon capture for Shell. How did that uh, intro happen between you and Jan, right? Because, you know, it sounds like, obviously, your, your new foray into this, right? You know, pre-2018, conceptually, the concept of carbon capture or anything that's associated with oil and gas, like, that wasn't really in your purview. Uh, how'd you end up getting connected? Yeah, so, so, uh, so I... Even though I was a renewable energy guy, the one thing I can say, my, uh, my brother was a hedge fund guy that um, traded energy stocks his whole life. Got and okay. so he, he, he so I, I, I knew some energy people um, and and he knew some energy people. And so there was a, a, a little bit of a network, um, a conventional energy, I should say. Um, and so uh, so uh, two, two things happened. One, 
Um, I hope he's okay with me using his name, but uh, uh, this guy, James Mackey, uh, and I had worked on some uh, some stuff in, in my previous uh, renewable energy days. Uh, he had been uh, with uh, Next Era and with Apex Wind, and, and so I knew James Mackey, and James Mackey had just uh, left uh, to go to OGCI and, Mm -hmm. and started as their managing, like literally he puts it up on LinkedIn that he's like, I'm happy to announce I'm starting as managing director at OGCI. (laughs) And I was like, Mackie. So I like pinged him right away and text him. I forget how it was like, I was like, you're, you're getting into CCS. I just started the CCS company. Like I'm out on my own. Like, and he's, he's like, that's (laughs) fantastic. So we, (laughs) we get on the phone and he's like, he's like, what do you need? Like, how can I help? And I was like, I don't actually know how to do this. <laughs> so like, do, do you have any ideas? Like, who, and, uh, and, um, and so, so Jan had been OGCI's, uh, or Shell's OGCI rep. I see. Represented. Okay. Okay. So, so they, like no within idea. the hallowed halls of OGCI, the oil and gas climate initiative, right. um, the, uh, Jan was the Shell representative and any, anybody that's ever worked with her, they know that she gets shit done. Right. And, yeah. and so, and, and she's the real deal. And so very good reputation. Um, so he's telling me, you know, he mentions her name. I look her up on LinkedIn and I'm like, what? I can't believe this woman's a free agent. Perfect. So I was like, I was like, you got to introduce me. And he's like, I just started here, man. I don't really know her. I just hear, you know, good stuff about her. Right? <laughs> so He's like, you got to go figure that out on your own. So, so I, so like, I'm like, link, like LinkedIn messaging. Excited, I can't help you at all. <laughs> I, I'm LinkedIn messaging her and she's not answering. And oh, so okay. then I get my brother on the phone and I was like, look at this woman's resume. Like, this is like, you know, like really impressive. Uh, and I'm like, I can't get her to answer, you know, a- answer my messages. And he's like, well, he was looking at it on LinkedIn too. And he's like, she's connected to David Heikkinen. And ah. so her, and he's like, I know David Heikkinen. I've you know played poker at his house or whatever. I forget what, yeah. what, what the example was. He's like, I've known hike for years. And uh, so Nick, re- my brother, Nick reaches out to hike and says, tell this woman, Jan Sherman to call my brother, Alex. <laughs> and so, and hike thankfully does. And, and hikes like s- sends her a message. that's like, uh, you know, Nick Tiller is a pretty good guy, but I don't know anything about his brother. <laughs> so, you know, be careful. <laughs> so anyways, uh, small world, but, good. but, and, 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 you know, that was right about the time that she had been retired for just enough time that I think she was starting to annoy her yeah, husband yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rearranging the closet a few times right. over. Um, so lucky timing. So that's awesome. So you guys get started and mm-hmm. almost off the back, the, the focus is let's respond to the RFP uh, focused on what ended up being, you know, ultimately Bayou Penn. So, yeah. So there was a couple of things. So uh, one, when she was skeptical and she's like, she's like, really, people are going to do startups in this space. And I was like, I don't know, but I am right. <laughs> like, <laughs> and she's like, and she's I'm like well, this no matter what you know she, you want to yeah, you can't, I, you know? I, I had left i had left my last shop like i was like i'm i'm you gonna go do this i i i i, re, I regretfully am gonna go do this and it's probably gonna be a donut was what i was thinking right like it's um <laughs> uh but uh and then she's like well what's the process to like to uh interview and stuff and i'm like this is it <laughs> like, <laughs> it's me and you <laughs> And she's like, what projects are we going to work on? And I was like, I've, I've got some project concepts that I've put together. I had like a slide deck and whatever. And she's like, all right, well, send them over. She's like, I know what good CCS projects are. And if they're any good, I'll call you back. And if not, you know, then, you know, I'll it'll be nice not. meeting you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, that was a that was a heart stopping, like pushing the button to send that because I was yeah. kind of like, Ugh. I, I did believe that she she knew what good stuff was, and that that would also suck if she came back and she's like, "This is all you know, dog crap." You're right? like, "I, like, I got to find some new projects." <laughs> right, that's right. So, um, the Texas RFP was one of one of the concepts in there, right? Um, and and so actually, uh, uh, Louisiana, which is uh, like the, a couple of our pro- those were, those two projects uh, were were in that uh, initial wow. kind of concept uh, deck. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, that was because, uh, brilliant people, uh, at, in Texas 
Tip Mackle had been out talking about offshore yep. for yep. so long and going to these conferences, and there had been so much data collected on this that it was just that it, it was it was that information asymmetry to a certain extent, like just awareness, being out looking, looking at the time, f- feeling confident in that I can make the revenue model piece of this work. I know how that works, um, but. Uh, going after the, oh, and and then Jan's resume was perfect for this, right? Jan built, or uh, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong and some oil and gas person is going to nail me on it, but um, she l- led the, 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 like, front end, like the design and engineering of right. Perdido, which is a very famous uh, offshore project for uh, for Shell in like 10,000 feet of water, right? Yeah. And, and so this woman had CCS experience and offshore yeah. development expertise. And so, you know, when we started looking at that and we we're like, you know, here's all the work that the state's done and the, the, you know, the, the DOE's paid for, the state's paid for this and that. And we were, we were just like, we, why not put in an offer? And, and so, so then, and, and, you know, let's see, let's, let's respond. There's going to be an RFP. The state had been saying, yeah. we didn't know when it was going to be. And, um, uh, so then we were like, okay, what would it take to win? Um, and what would, like, how would we go, how would we approach this? Um, and so, uh, uh, um, one of the other really kind of interesting, uh, things, this was one of Jan's ideas, which I thought was brilliant as, um, she, she went out and found all the RFPs that she could find that had anything to do with, with CO2, with carbon. Right. Um, and she basically merged it all into a single doc. And then just started pretending like that was the RFP. Like we didn't know what was going to be in the RFP, but to I, draw on other RFPs in other areas sure. and to try to frame that towards this area that was like, we didn't know how big, what day, this, that, what, what have you, uh, how the RFP was going to come out, but we could start to respond to it and, 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 um, uh, and start to, to be thinking about the project. And one of the things that, you know, there was a section on operations and we we're like, ah, oh, crap, how are we going to do this? Two man bands going to look pretty weak. This is going to look weak. This is not going to fly. So, no, so then, uh, <laughs> so, so then we, uh, we decided that we, we needed, uh, we, we were going to need to partner with somebody on that. And at the same time, so Jan's kind of working on this, this right. faux RFP to try to get us ahead of the game. Um, uh, uh, I was also taking her out. We were uh, meeting with investors. We were trying to figure out how we were going to capitalize the business. Where were we going to? Was it going to look like a venture deal? Is it going to be a PE back? Uh, like, like, let's go out and talk to the market. Let's just do a bunch of meetings. Right. And so we were meeting with this one investor, um, and uh, the investors like, uh, you guys are kind of interesting. This is kind of cool. Like. What do you need? Like what? Like uh, other than money, what do you need? And we were like, we need an operator. Like we had a, yeah. and, like we were ready to go, and and again, lucky timing, like stars align. The guy sitting across the table from us was like, I'm on the board of directors at Talos Energy. There, and they go. would be, and they would be interested in in yeah. uh, in hearing this because they're they're thinking about carbon as well. Right. And so he very quickly uh, was able to set up a senior, you know, us right into the C-suite. Uh, uh, we did a phone call with t- uh, Tim Duncan and, and um, uh, a handful of other people. Uh, Bob was on that call and a handful of other people. And then they were like, you know, you guys should come in and like, let's meet. And uh, so I flew down. This was still COVID. So that I think that was my first trip after uh, COVID started to, to kind of reopen up and, um, flew down, uh, Jan and I had never met in person. Wow. We'd only been on zoom. Um, by the way, that would and, only happen during COVID time, right? Like where you oh can start God. a business with someone who lives, you know, in another part of the country, you've never met them in person. And by the time totally. you meet, like, Oh my God, we've talked for you know hundreds of hours. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So anyway, so, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we met with, uh, the Talos folks and, um, we were, we pretty quickly put together, a, a an agreement, uh, to go after that project 50, 50 that, and it mm-hmm. was, you know, Talos, uh, has since built out a, a low carbon team and they're, uh, super fantastic people, uh, with great capabilities. Uh, but at the time, they didn't know anything about tax credits. They didn't know anything sure. about carbon offsets, and nobody in the 
shop had touched CO2 uh, like Jan had. So, so it was, uh, it was a very complimentary uh, and it was, it was good enough uh, that, that, you know, we won and we put together a pretty compelling uh, RFP response. Eventually the RFP came out. Uh, we had it halfway filled out. Like once we signed up the joint bidding, we basically started working on it. And, and again, lucky timing uh, or, or appropriate timing that, uh, that we had done all these other things that led up to it because w- within a matter, like it was like a week or two later than GLO like announces that RFP okay. and we, we already had our team set up and ready to go. And it had a really short fuse. It had like a four week response window. Which was perfect um, for you guys, and, right? Like not good for anybody else, but if, for your purposes, we, you guys. We thought we it. thought it was we thought it was really written for somebody else for a super major sure. that had ha- had the ends and they they already knew who they wanted and and so thus it was such a compressed window so that only so and like it was asking for ridiculous things. It was asking for you know give three examples of uh like like it, they wanted to do a reference check on uh three other carbon projects that you've been involved in right and like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- so there's not barrier. very many yeah there's yeah. almost nobody that, that could do that right, right. um yeah. and and but we had so one of the things that we had done was one of my uh a, a guy that i went to business school with uh is a former bp executive uh, with, uh, this guy was uh, and, and, um, so he, he joined my board r- right away, r- joined the board of directors right away. And, and, and so, I, you know, we, we had put together the right team with sure. had run North Africa for BP. And, uh, there's this famous project there called Insala that's in Algeria. And so, so that was one of our, and they called Algeria, like the state of Texas called Algeria to wow. confirm that Wassam was involved in the company and was involved in that project. Jan uh, had uh, done the Quest project uh, for Shell right. in uh, Alberta, Canada. And then uh, we uh, we had another uh, um, uh, a guy named David Greeson that had done the Petronova project. He was just yeah. like an advisor for us. Uh, but we were, but you got you your know, three we, reference checks, right? We there. got our three, <laughs> but see, and, and, and Talos wouldn't have had anybody. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, so this little company that that was just a couple of people and some advisors and, you know, board folk, like, like we were able to kind of cobble it together. And that's, we, we've kind of continued with that, bringing these uh, really um, kind of unique experts together um, that are what well, things that we think are real friction points in, in putting a CCS project together. That four week time fuse, one is, is sort of nuts, but two I don't think any other large company would have been able to mobilize. Like, sure, the resources exist. I just don't think anyone else would have had sort of the willingness to pull something together in four weeks, even if they have all the people on the team. There, there were 12 total responses, okay? But, and there were some big companies in there, but I, I don't know what they submitted. Like, I right. think it might have been – they they might have pulled together the team and thrown something over the wall, but it, yeah, they, you know, they might have been like, oh, I think this is a yeah, this is like sort of our indication of interest, and then yeah. we're gonna you know really fully fill this out over time, right? But by bringing in Talos, Talos had three D seismic for the entire area, and I don't know that these you know some of these other groups that were like an LNG company that's onshore that has no like no. they they just didn't have the things that we had and, and the capabilities that we had and the experience that we had. So anyways, it was a seminal moment for, for carbon vert and, um, and yeah, we've been off to the races ever since and, and doing similar stuff. Well, one that's, you know, obviously an awesome Genesis story and then uh, that project coming together, which has now sort of changed hands a couple of times. Um, <laughs> bef- before we get into that, you, you sort of mentioned talking to a lot of investors you're trying to figure out, should this be, sort of a venture back business, should this be a private equity port code type business? Yep. You know, when you guys came out, I think it was relatively novel. And I suspect a lot of private equity funds, you know, I, I know this firsthand. You know, I have a belief that I think these businesses are so capital intensive, they probably ought to be out the gate, a private equity back control equity back uh, sort of entity, no different yep. than the way oil and gas venture worked for a very long time. You guys have a very unique situation and perhaps a partial monetization 
leading to a full monetization of Bayou Ben has allowed you the opportunity to stay venture back. But how do you think about that? Uh, that that was the debate, and it continues to be. You know, what's the right what's the right model for the market? We we raised uh, we we raised a venture style round first. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, my brother uh, was a hedge fund guy, so we it, it, in, energy trader. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we have pretty sophisticated friends and family, I guess I would say. Um, yeah. And so we were able to pull together a, a, a venture style seed round. We used a safe note to do it, yeah. um, which is me pulling on some of this dopey stuff I was doing out in Silicon Valley with like auto watts. Right. So, so I, I kind of came from it with um, a little bit of uh, a, a wider aperture. Sure. Um, and I don't know that I appreciated certainly these lar- the large projects that we were able to to win out of the gate. Um, I knew these were high capex, but like, oh, it's nuts. It, I don't think I fully appreciated how how capital intensive it was going to sure. be. But then I also was like, well, you know, I know how project finance works, right? I mean, right. tax equity is a slice of of the project finance cap, cap capital stack. And I know how all of the project finance has happened in renewable energy. And very, when when solar started, there there were no PE shops, right? There were right. And, and there were no consolidators, and you really didn't know what your exit was going to be. You're kind of like, oh, shit, I'm going to own this thing, I guess, for 20 years and collect revenue, right? Like, right. Um, and, and so uh, so I had seen different things. I don't think I was overly influenced that it had to be private equity. Um, I just kind of figured that we would figure it out and get it done as we went. Uh, we have been very fortunate. I know that um, private equity serves a very important role, and uh, I am not at all saying down on private equity. I think private equity um, is 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 a very efficient way, uh, but I think it also needs a certain level of maturity in the market that. We're, I, I still don't know if we're exactly there yet with with uh, with this business because these projects take so long and because yeah. there's so much uncertainty around um, around um, when you're going to get your class six permit and things like that and that does not match well for private equity. No, these are not cash flow ready and so so it's uh, it's a tweener. It's hard to it's hard to say what is the right way. We've been fortunate. We, we, we got numerous offers to, to be private equity backed. I also kind of like it's just a personal belief that as soon as you sign up with a private equity shop, you've just sold your business, right? They're, They're in charge. They call option on your business, right? Because uh, it's, you, you don't have control. And look, and they're aware of it too, right? Like that is, yeah. that is yeah. the price you pay to get access to hundreds of millions of dollars without having to go, you know. But, I, but, but, but time, you don't right? need $100 million on day one. No, right? you right. need it in these projects. You need it. You're going to need it later. Right. You will need it, and it's going to suck. Right. Um, but but you can do a lot with a little in the beginning, right. or at least for the first few. Uh, Origination they, they, and land grab, right, is not uh, the vast majority of the capex for these projects. Right. Right. And so so we were able to yeah. So we we did not feel like selling our business. We felt like. It was a mega trend that we were walk, walking into. We thought we had unique capabilities and vision. We thought that we probably understood this better than any private equity shop out there because they really didn't get it yet. Yeah. Um, and and they were and and the ones that did get it are just like J curve sucks, right? Like that that was all like <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many of those conversations we had, and there and, and so. And we're like, look, if you want to be in the space, like this is this is how to do it. There's nothing done and dusted with a bow on it, with all the off no, no, take no, no. contracts ready to go, and there won't be for years. So our our it's willingness, tough. yeah, it's yeah, tough. and 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 again, we were also in this unique situation where I'd had a pretty good career, I'd had my you know exit. Yep. Jan had retired. Oh, yeah, she had she had a good career. We, we we were you know we raised we raised money from people that we knew that trusted us and so um and and with that we were able to hire up some other people and and and, and do some stuff uh, and sign you know sign our first uh, lease bonus um and and so um 
Yeah, it's been it's been a fortunate way that it's worked out for us. But I but I that doesn't mean that if somebody goes out and takes private equity to start a CCS shop, that that's necessarily bad. Uh, we've just been very fortunate that we've been able yeah. to have I mean, those monetization yeah. early early monetization events as well. Uh, and now we kind of control our destiny. Like, yeah, I think there's a little bit, yeah, you've been a little bit of humble, right? Which is, I think 95% of the teams, maybe even higher, that want to go chase this sort of business plan are going to be forced to raise control equity. Uh, they don't have the luxury of going out and being able to, to do it the way you and Jan have. And I think that comes from sort of a, a phenomenal track record historically, right? Um, uh, perhaps yeah. not in this exact business, but in, in you know, sort of a, a prior life. Um, yep. And I'm not, yep. yeah. I no, appreciate that. Going to come out of the gate that way, so it's interesting. There's, and you know, <laughs> there's smart teams out there. Some of them are just. I think Jan and I have a pretty high risk tolerance too. Of just like, right. I don't know. Let's go take a take a run at this, and we'll just start writing some checks off of our checkbooks and see what happens. Well, so so if you think about the origination and the land grab in the Gulf Coast, which is where you guys have really spent all of your time, to my knowledge. What inning do you think we're in of that from a – call it small companies being involved? Because we've already seen – like Bayou Bend is a great you know, sort of example to walk through the timeline of. That project is no longer in the hands of anyone small or independent. You know, Talos recently exited. You guys exited last year. Now we have Chevron, Equinor, and Total. Yeah. All measures that – you know, we'll, we'll see what the timeline looks like relative to the speed that you and Talos were moving at. How do you think about the rest of the Gulf Coast? Are we in the late stages here, or are we still in the early stages? Um, in the offshore, the, I would say we're uh, – I guess the question is l – let me clarify. Are we talking about the poor space acquisition game or, or of the total CCS? Because, I mean, the, yeah. almost nothing is on stream right now, right? Like right. almost yeah. nothing is getting captured – and and going down hold like there's we're still early in the, the 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 CCS business for the Gulf Coast is extremely early first inning first inning for sure right I think uh, about it as two different land grabs because I get this question a lot which is like how do you think about the CCS land grab and I'm like you're thinking about it as an oil and gas person which is we're gonna go get a bunch of acreage and then we're gonna drill wells on it which is not this is more of a waste management business so it's a little bit different yeah. so. The poor space is the poor space. Yep. Um, and that's a land grab happening on poor space. The other uh, land grab that you and I know quite well is how do we sign up emissions, right? Yeah. How do we yeah. sign up? You know, whether you want to call them emitters, you want to call them customers. You know, these are people who want to dispose of their carbon. They have some need yeah. to. Perhaps they don't have too much of a need to. And they've got to dedicate it to somebody. And I think that's... In fact, in, in my opinion, maybe even a more valuable land grab, right, which is how do you get those contracts in some form or fashion? How do you get the dedication or the uh, the rights? Yeah. Um, and and, and, I and you can't get that right. until you get the land first, though. Like you got to be able to point to where – problem, right? Uh, yeah, you got to be able to point to where you're going to put it, right? right? Just just knocking on the door and saying, hey, we're going to um, – that that will come. There, there will be a, a, a mature a, – the industry will mature over time and at some point – there's going to be enough storage solutions and enough pipelines and so forth that somebody could come and just kind of uh, um, come in and, and say, hey, we're going to help you with capture and we're going to we'll figure it out. We'll use one of the various alternatives. Uh, right. But but it's really uh, uh, so. So so where you're going with your thinking is is right. And, and the answer across the board there is that it's still super early innings. The, the only thing that is um, fairly mature is this poor space um uh acquisition uh that that has has occurred and is occurring and it, it will continue to occur people will continue to lease up for space mm -hmm. uh but a lot of the really good acreage has been has been leased in my opinion um and uh and and so i do think that uh and really big you know we think that it's not just about the quality you know the oil and gas people talk about the quality of the rock right. it's not just the quality of the pore space it's it, it it's the 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 size the mass and scale um and and, and then also proximity to emissions yep. um and so uh the early adopters have gone very quickly to pore space near uh near the emissions and um and anything that's not leased up somebody'll lease it up um, 
prices have been moving up uh, significantly over the past couple of years. Um, that that's pre- pretty well chewed up at this point. Uh, but but that's that's not the end of the game, right? The whole, the sure. game is putting together the whole project and getting these c- customer uh, commitments and 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 building the pipe uh, to connect uh, the various customers and figuring out how to do that. Uh, you know, it's not really last mile in this business. It's that, you know, last 20 miles, last 50 miles. How do you get that to your site? Um, yeah. that, that there's a lot of, a lot of wood to be chopped, uh, in, in, in those categories still. So it's an interesting thought experiment, right? Because if the tier one, let's call it offshore projects are sort of chewed, you know, sort of taken down in the Gulf coast, you now seen these projects, you know, you've seen them personally change hands, right? You uh, and Talos moving them. Yeah. You guys moved incredibly quickly, in, in my opinion. Like, right, like, you know, four years ago, there was no real Carbivert, right? And uh, you sort of have gone through the entire life cycle, at least of the, the beginning phases of those projects. Now yeah. that they're owned by, you know, various strategics, do you think that timeline is, you know, they, you know Carbonvert and Talos in this example don't have the luxury of time. You guys have to move very quickly. In some ways, these larger operators have the luxury of time. Do you think we're going to see this next phase be a much longer slowdown the same way that we saw, let's say, in the early days of this industry because it was owned by the larger strategics? I think it depends uh, depends on the group and who yeah. who's the operator and, and, and what they're really trying to get accomplished. Um, I, I think, you know, Exxon took down significant acreage in the last yeah. lease round. Uh, BP took down acreage, and then we we took down acreage with uh, with our partnership with Repsol um, as the operator, and so uh, so we were the th- the three big winners in the last RFP uh, process, and that is the highest quality offshore acreage in the United States. Bar not, like like the good stuff is is definitely controlled now. Um, yeah. and closest to the emissions. Um, there's plenty of good stuff onshore as well. Um, uh, you know, again, it doesn't all have to be offshore. We focused on that because we like the scale, uh, yeah. and scale matters. You're going to be um, much larger projects at, at least on the disposal side. Yeah. Offshore. That's right. That's right. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's part of part of the value proposition of, of having Carbonvert involved in a deal is that we're all about trying to keep the project moving fast, keep that urgency. Um, and, and I think people like to partner with us. And, you know, we heard from some of our previous partners um, that, you know, sorry to see you go because, uh, you know, we they, they valued that we uh, one had experience and knew what we were talking about. And we're uh, added value to the the, the partnership, uh, and and you know we were always cost conscious and 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 velocity centric, right? So yeah, um, I I don't know what other people will do, but I'll I'll tell you that you know when we're involved in a project, that's what we'll be that's yeah, that's what we'll bring to that project, right? So we're now in an interesting era, let's say today versus like a couple of years ago, at least on. You know, we, we talk a lot about the poor space side and putting together these projects from the beginning from a storage perspective. Transport's interesting now, right? Because, you know, we, we had a series of very well-funded guys attempting to do, let's call it Midwest transport, which I suspect yeah. you spent a lot of time looking at. And now we're really <laughs> left with, call it one man standing, uh, yeah. which some ways is good. And in a lot of ways is, you know, it's, it's not fun to have any, any early stage startup that's taken a lot of risk not really pan out for the industry as a whole, right? It's going to slow things down. Mm-hmm. What's your What's your take looking forward on the transport side of things, at least onshore? I, I, I um, it's interesting. I think that but there's this old saying that um, if you're a hammer, all you see are nails, right? Yeah. Like that's, and I think pipeline people want to build pipes. Yeah. And that might not always that might not always be the right solution, right? Right? Or or the, right. you know so, um, I we we do need to build pipe. It yeah. is the lowest cost, highest efficiency, safest. All the like it it is all these things are true. That, but um, I think it's a daunting task to build a, a mega architecture. Um, 
And when you looked at the capital efficiency, like the cap, the utilization of capital on those projects, um, it, it, it was, it's, it, it's a head scratcher for me. I, I, all those places need to be decarbonized. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that one big massive architecture from the beginning is the way to do it. I think you might need to do clusters and I get that that's not as fun or sexy or great to, to raise capital around story. Uh, but, but there's a practicality, um, not all the ethanol sits on and not all the industry, uh, in, in, uh, in middle America sits on good pore space. Um, but, you should also probably go to where the good emissions sit on pore space first. Right. And, and, but, and so if somebody else wants to go work on that and crack that nut, like I'm all for it, go for it. I do not like to see projects fail. I, we, we know the group that was working on that and they're all great people and very smart and um, wish them the best and, and uh, hope they come back out and do another CCS project because lots of carbon needs to be captured Right. moved and stuck in the ground. Um, but I, I just feel like um, some pe- people are going to do what they know. Uh, and and that's why we did offshore and everybody right. else thought we were completely insane. That's I right. Had, I, I, I had, yeah, uh, uh, it's one of our competitors, but it's not really, we haven't, we don't step on each other's toes too much, but they're just like, never do like, why would you ever do something in the offshore that could be done in the onshore? Right. And we just like, I get that makes sense. I get that as a uh, philosophical approach that the oil and gas business has taken in the past. And there's a lot of truth to that, but the, the other, they just didn't see the other good reasons. And that when you apply a, a factor, a scale factor to this, the, the things that they're concerned about go away. Right. And, right. and, and, um, and now you're just stuck with something that's actually very much on uh, in parity to what you can achieve onshore uh, in a total cost and, you know, uh, uh, and from a, a, you know, stored CO2 standpoint. Um, but it's at, at a mega scale compared to what you can do on, in the onshore without right. signing up 5,000 leases with 5,000 different right. people. Right. And ultimately, if you believe it's a big boy game, you sort of have to think like, what does the big boy want? Does the big boy mm-hmm. want uh, a couple of these onshore projects? You yeah. know, uh, history would tell you, no, that's not really what they yeah. want. Yeah. They want to place and, the could park billions of dollars. And that's very hard to do logistically if you're looking onshore, right? Uh, and, and it's like, do I really want to have 5,000 lease owners or 1,000 lease owners that are – some of right. them are sophisticated and some of them are not? I mean, that's – I go back to my solar stuff. Yeah. Like, it, you know, we used to do residential rooftop all the way up to, you know, CNI and utility scale, but like – there's a school of thought like I, I don't I don't want to be fighting with some lady about how this looks on a roof and you yeah. know whether my truck backed over her petunias right like like yeah. just and and so you you get different um, yeah selecting where you go and where you spend your time and money is important and yeah we like where we've gone so far it doesn't mean we won't do onshore by the way we will do onshore uh, but. Do you think there's going to be enough, uh, do, like, if, as you guys have looked at, like, poor space, you know, obviously we have the Midwest projects that are going on, uh, you know, um, and then we have some, call it Nagas treating related projects that are going on in Louisiana and a couple things going on in Wyoming. What do you think about, you know, Appalachia and Rockies that have been discussed for a while? Like, do you think there's quality enough poor space that's adjacent to some of those emissions to, to work? Or do you think we're, you know, that's call it a, another phase that we're not in yet? Uh, there is quality pore space that can work, uh, certainly in Colorado, in the Rockies. Um, I'm, I'm in Colorado. Uh, we don't have a project in Colorado. We'd love to. Um, and there's really interesting legislation being proposed here. Uh, Wyoming, we, we, we're kicking around in Wyoming. We're doing some stuff up there, uh, right now. Um, and so, uh, look, I, I think it, it can and should be done. Uh, Appalachia has challenges and has, um, it's not a slam dunk. It's not easy, but yeah. you can do some of these smaller projects, uh, in, in Appalachia. And so, uh, I just, I don't know that that's where we, 
we we've looked at some we've looked at some opportunities and it's never a hard no but i haven't we're not at the phase right now where uh we we need to be cobbling together a lot of smaller projects we're, we're we'll get there because yeah. the big the big ones will get done right the big ones will get locked up and and the missions will be committed the poor space will be committed and and then you got to move on right and and you got to go solve more problems elsewhere and it'll get harder and harder and harder quite frankly right. um and and that's where you hope that the costs come down permitting smooths out uh, uh you know timelines uh things like that come in to, to offset some of some of those challenges um so i i i think all of it should be done it should be yeah. done in the rockies it should be done in appalachia i just it, the question is is today the day that you do right. it and you go back to solar i went to hawaii first to do it you know hawaii and california were the markets and then on the coast of the u.s that's where the most expensive power is that has opened up and then slowly it's kind of eaten inside in into the interior right. of the country um at, as good. you hit price parity and it, 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 you know on costs and things like that so i think that that same thing will happen here with ccs so when you think about the next phase you have a phenomenal portfolio let's say of these projects with your original thesis which is we really like the scale of these top tier offshore prospects you've been fortunate to get a lot of ownership in some of these to sort of further develop them mm -hmm. what's the next phase here is it to try to find the next tier or is it some adjacent opportunities to what you're doing there how do you think about the world yeah i we spend a lot of time thinking about this and i, I don't have like a, a certain uh a slam dunk i know it's going to be this is the answer um i think that we have uh we, we've kind of picked picked a few themes uh that 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 we're that we're working on um in, in a few different areas and um they, they will probably be smaller projects uh, and, and you'll have to, uh, I mean, you know, two, two of the three offshore projects that, that we've been involved in so far have been our 20 million ton per year projects. Yeah. The, the scale of that is astronomical. If, if this is a, an interesting one, Raj, if you look at all the utility scale solar in the entire state of California, okay, it's taken three decades to build it out. Um, everybody thinks California is so progressive on so sure. renewables and this and that, right? If you look at the, the, all of the utility scale solar and, and you run a comparison that, okay, solar is, is a, an avoidance of right. a hydrocarbon, uh, created electron that, that avoidance in carbon is 20 million tons a year. Wow. So our one project in Corpus Christi right now is the same carbon avoidance impact in one project that that the that it has taken th 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 three decades and I don't know how many billions of dollars uh, and how many people and what have you to build out in, uh, for carbon avoidance in the state of California. So these are really big mega mega projects. Yeah, from a storage yeah. perspective, you've locked up. They're not small, right? Like you found uh, what, you know, like you just take the basket of all these storage projects, even you guys have just been involved in. It's insane, yeah. right? Yeah, right. And so we've been in two of those. And then we've also <laughs> got our Louisiana project, which is like eight or nine million tons a year of storage, sure. right? So almost, almost, half, and, and could size up easily to be half, uh, you know, to, to could size up to be 10 million tons a year. So we'll, they start we'll looking see. at sort of how can you integrate other parts of the value chain here, right? One of those, I don't know. We want to get into anything on the carbon flex front, but uh, you know, that's an interesting adjacency as well, right? Yeah, so so we're seeing um, an interesting need um, with so you 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 said it right earlier, right? Emitters are customers. You have existing customers. You have that tend to cluster together um and be in proximity where you know where is a good place to build one refinery typically you'll sure. find several where is a good place to to build one chemical plant you'll typically find several where is a good place to build an lng facility typically you'll find more than one right and so um and so there's some interesting things that can be done with uh with with customers one in helping them um 
with their capture, financing, owning, tax credits, things things along those lines, but also in trying to optimize um, h- how you connect those facilities mm-hmm. and, and, and then go to storage, right? Because the storage is there. We, we've got the storage, whether Carbon Birds ha- has it somebody or somebody else has it. Um, we can, we can do some, something good in, in clustering them together. And then, um, and then one of the, uh, other interesting things that we, we found out was we were getting a lot of phone calls from Greenfield project developers, uh, that were saying, Hey, you know, we're, we're trying to cite our project. We want to, we want to mm-hmm. bring it to, you know, near, near you guys. Uh, but they'd have 50,000 tons a year of CO2 or, or maybe 200 or whatever. They're never going to be able to sure. afford their own yeah. well. Um, and so there's an opportunity that we're working on called Carbonplex, where we basically co-locate uh, greenfield projects that, that are on a carbon theme, decarbonized it's sustainable aviation fuel. It's, it's mm-hmm. you know, blue hydrogen. It's this, it's that, whatever the products might be. Um, it's a recycling business. It's something along those lines. So, so creating a, a plug and play, think about it like an industrial park where somebody can come build their carbon related project and you've got a carbon services layer kind of built yeah. in with shared compression, shared dehydration, shared interconnect. Um, and so we're spending time uh, on this concept that we call carbon plex uh, to, to try to figure out um how and where and when and and you know we're looking for the right the right partners to to potentially uh help us uh we we think it's a very replicatable model and so Mm -hmm. you know who who does what how how did the economics work so some uh, you know some business development on that front i i when i first was introduced to the concept i i liked it a lot because to me it's almost like okay let's make the carbon disposal part of our business a utility, just like all the other things that we like, we need to consume power. We need to have waste management. We need to have all these sorts of things. You know, can we get to the point where this non-core part of our business is viewed much more like a utility and uh, you're the services provider to that utility and sort of make it plug and play because like ultimately their core business is very different uh, than what it's hard enough to build your billion dollars sustainable aviation fuel plant and make that thing run and worry about your feedstocks and, you know, and worry about your offtake and, and get those contracts and then just operational excellence, right? Like the, the doing all the other stuff that you have to do to, to make that sustainable or low carbon or blue um, Mm -hmm. is, is, is complicated, right? That's right. And this is, uh, you know, forget about the cost for a moment. It's like a mental bandwidth issue, right? Like it goes back to the team of engineers saying, we could do this. We have the money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but is this the best use of your time and resources? Right. Uh, right. Probably not. Right. Um, and it would, you know, like in the same way that like, I don't have a water well at my house. I, I'm not, you know, like I haven't fully integrated all the electricity to provide here, but maybe resin yeah. solar becomes a thing at some point here. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. um, yeah, like it would be much nicer what? to think of this or set a... your house up to be completely off grid. Like what? Yeah, like like and, yeah, I get know... that you could, but you'd spend a whole lot of your time and money and days and Correct. right, like you know, like in, in... friends who would love to do that. You know, they're doomsday yeah. prepping. You know, as we speak, but you know, I'm certainly not. You know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've got some other stuff. I'd like. You know, if this is the end, I, I won't. I don't want to spend all my time thinking about the end. I'll tell you that. You That's know? right. <laughs> So, so that's awesome. So we've got, you know, Carbonplex is a new opportunity potentially uh, based mm-hmm. on sort of early customer demand. What do you think are, call it the number one misconception you're hearing from potential customers or emitters that you, you wish, you know, let's say on a long enough tar- time horizon, everyone will understand? Well, I, I don't even know if it's the customers or the emitter. Like the, the big challenge or number one concern that I have right now is just this uh, – there is a, a, a dramatic disconnect within uh, the environmental community mm-hmm. uh, on on what their their purpose is, and mm-hmm. and I know this I, I because I was you know a solar guy and 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 ha- happy to still tell you all the reasons why solar is a fantastic technology mm-hmm. and we should deploy as much of it as we possibly can, but that the 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 folks that are just saying like 
it's just got to all be solar and, and wind and batteries and right. we got to shut down all of the, the, you know, everything that's conventional and, and hydrocarbon driven. Uh, I like I I struggle because I, these people don't really they're not proposing a solution that's realistic, right? Or possible. There's not enough mined copper. There's not enough of the critical minerals. There's not enough of the manufacturing to get that. Like you can't even get a, like the, like substations and transformers. Those are on two year backlogs yeah, right now. Just in right general, now. like. It, the grid doesn't work that way. Like it's just to me, there's a real problem, and and you know I'll I'll take to task uh, some of your listeners that that are you know historic oil and gas folks. The the real problem, in my opinion, is that so for so long the industry denied, it, at least in the U.S., den, denied the the environmental impact of CO2 and methane going into the atmosphere. I just, it, like, tried to find other science, like made bogus science, whatever. They've blown their credibility with these other groups that that are like all – it was a fine thing for them to say back then because all they had to do is be like oil and gas is the enemy, right? right. Yep. The real enemy is, is, is carbon and yep. methane, right? Like it's the emission that you're trying to not have go in the atmosphere, yep. right? And, and, and so, and you know, you want to go electric, great. Like you're going to have to mine a bunch of stuff and te- yeah. like literally bulldoze mountains to get to right. that. And they're going to be gone. And so there's an environmental impact on both sides, uh, right. To, of this. And so, but the oil and gas industry, like just really did itself such a disservice because they're not considered credible to the really far leaning, uh, environmentalists that are just that, the only mantra that they've been taught or been able to wrap their head around uh, because it was, it was nonsense to chase the, the, the goofy science that the oil and gas business was, was trying to prove and whatever, like they, they didn't need to do the technical arguments. They just said, you right. guys are nuts. This is right. bullshit. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and so that's, that's what we have to overcome because America is confused and the environmentalists are confused and people are scared of, of CO2 pipelines. And, and they've got all kinds of garbage running. And then, you know, it's just been okay, the biggest you... hindrance to the Midwest uh, transportation project, right? Which is who had on the bingo card that, you know, like if, if you if you talk to every investment professional who's looking at the project, they said, oh, my God, it's going to be incredibly expensive. Oh, yep. it's not going to generate returns. Oh, the permitting process. Like, do you know how long it takes to get a classic permit? Oh, these wells are going to leak. Nope. Yep. That wasn't the issue. The yeah. issue was people in their own communities that actually – you know, in theory, benefited uh, from 45Q trickling down to their their yeah. land in some form or fashion. They say, hey, I'm out on this. This isn't environmentally uh, positive. When in reality, it, it certainly is and uh, would have would have funded uh, a lot of their local communities, right, unfortunately. Well, and, and now they're just going to put it in a rail car or a truck and they're going to move it that it's way. And guess what? Like now the works. school bus is going to get hit by a truck full of CO2 or something. That's like right. it, It's right. just like... I, you know, so I think that there's a knowledge gap issue. I think people don't, these, this is super complicated stuff yeah. and people have very short attention spans. The, the, the environmentalists, uh, are some of them, not all of them, but like, um, are, are confusing the story there. There's, uh, there's other really practical folks. Like we have to stop these emissions from going into the atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like we just, it's, <laughs> They're just going up, right? Which is, you know, like, and, and so you have to debate the alternative, which is like, oh, is carbon capture and avoidance, you know, like, do we really care? We should be doing carbon removal. It's like, yeah, but the, the carbon removal, you know, whether it happens or not, great. But again, to your point, let's say a billion and a half dollar facility that is first of its kind that may, may do half a million tons a year. I'm all for, like, someone's got to spend the money. Someone's got to do it. But to your point, you know, we've got But you can't emitter- make the steel to make the the the, the okay, device yeah. without like yeah. hydrocarbons, right? And there, and, yeah. and so then to just say, well, we just gotta stop all of this. And like we, we would go exactly one day and more people would die. Like, That's like not practical, you, right? You so, can't go to the hospital, you can't you, like it's just it's 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 stupid, right? It's 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 literally 
the naivest thing I've ever heard to just say, we're just going to stop. And that's the solution. And, that's right. and until that day, like we're just like, we're, yeah. So I think that that's the big challenge right now. I think there's a lot of motivated people um, yeah. that should come into this space. And, 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 and the best way to make is, is, you know, build a workforce around it. And those people are going to know people and those people are going to, have a cousin and this and that that says oil and gas is bad. And they're going to say, yeah. and, no, and so people like in the yeah. industry um, uh, w- and building an industry and having successful projects right. um, will hopefully, hopefully help, but it's not going to be easy. But the, when things are challenging, that's, that's when opportunity arises. Right. And that's right. there's, yeah. I, I've told people before that it's like, if I don't care what, line of thing you're into there's probably a carbon angle for it yeah. and if you're trying to think what to do next i think just pick the theme carbon decarb decarbonization carbon management what how, however you want to say it uh there's carbon accounting there's it's, it's a secular trend <laughs> right it's a secular trend it's... and i i think your point is well understood which is we have um i think about it this way which is like let's say you have 10 percent of the population that sits on each side of an issue. So one may be like, we don't want oil and gas, like it's horrible. Like we don't want any of this carbon, like forget about carbon capture. We just need to be talking about renewables, whatever it is. And then the other side, which is, you know, sort of wholly the opposite, equal amounts of people, call it 10% or something. For, mm-hmm. And uh, they say the opposite, which is like, forget about all these renewable projects. Like they're not cost competitive. We're just gonna keep doing what we do, you know, whatever. And the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Like it's a multivariant sort of uh, problem. But the two sort of binary outcomes are not only the loudest uh, population, but they're also the easiest to get behind because it's yeah. a very team mentality, right? Like human beings are hardwired to be like, this is my team, this is your team. Pick which yeah. side of the fence you're on. Uh, yeah. Whereas uh, there is now this popular narrative that's coming about, which is like this sort of all of the above energy uh, becomes a, a topic of conversation. We've got to see what that looks like. I don't know. Like in a year, there'll be a new phrase, right? Like, um, yeah. But overall, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. And I think your point is well suited, which is um, if everyone loved it, it probably wouldn't be a good economic opportunity because then everyone <laughs> will want to be in the business, right? Like, so by definition, yeah. there is some value to people being yeah. like, oh, I don't like the line of work you're in. Uh, that yeah. generates some sort of economic rent that ultimately makes this business the most sustainable it could be. So that's you know, interesting. I, 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 you know, I, I like that. what you're doing. I think, you know, I think the market needs to grow as much as humanly possible. If, if you weren't playing CCS for a moment, because you are a serial entrepreneur, what do you see out there that's like, oh, that would, uh, that would be my next venture. Uh, that, that's where I'd love to spend some more time. Well, so, I mean, I, I think back, to, I think I would still be on the carbon theme, right? Okay. I, um, but I'm not sure. I don't know if it matters. The, everything we have to re-engineer. So whether CCS is carbon capture and storage, so that's capture, transport, store. Uh, but there's all these businesses that need to support that, to monitor that. There's, you have to have this MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification uh, that's not only to qualify the tax credits, but then MRV also works for carbon offsets. And the, so there's um, there's very technical, practical work to be done. Um, we talked with one of the uh, one of the big um, big four accounting firms. Uh, I guess this is maybe about a year ago. They they told us that they were hiring thirty five thousand carbon accounting people. Wow. Like now, I don't know what the period of time was for that, and and I don't know if they're done or this it or that. Depends on the SEC, you know, sort of execution uh, things like that. I suspect. Yeah, I mean, there, there's and so great. You're an accountant, or you you know what accounting is. Well, think about carbon accounting, right? There's this yeah. whole other thing, and so so you know, d- depends on and there's the capital market side of it. There's a need for people to to figure this out and smooth this out and. And, and and bring capital and create products, um, you know, uh, create risk products uh, if you're in the insurance business. I, so all, all these things, um, I just see it as a massive growth sector. And, you know, if you're in banking, I don't like how much does other banking grow? 
I don't know, right? Yeah. And how uh, right. if you're in real estate uh, development, a lot more, lots more real estate development. I don't know, like maybe. Um, and, and, the and, on carbon is great, right? Like you're sort of like hard to deny that we're not going to have a massive growth rate in this sector. It's, it's, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that hasn't been figured out, and that needs to be figured out, and that creates opportunity for entrepreneurs, and it creates opportunity for people that don't necessarily need to be like the the entrepreneur that takes all the risk but want to go get a job doing something that they wake up every day feeling good about what they're working on and uh they're they're cha- you know they get to experience challenging work and um and so so yeah I, I i would just pick the theme through and through i'm sold out on the theme yeah i love it okay well good good deal well you know, I, I find this hilarious. We started off before we started recording thinking uh, we wouldn't be able to go for a half hour uh, without it getting boring. And uh, like, um, <laughs> this is going to be the longest episode by far oh, that I got so far. So, so holy I love Holy cow, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rush. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm, I'm good. Did we go what uh, did we not cover anything uh, that you think uh, would be worthwhile going over? I think we got it all, man. <laughs> Do you want to know what I'm going to have for dinner tonight, too? <laughs> the steak? What's going on? You know? <laughs> well, okay. Well, this has been awesome. If people want to find you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, I, you know what? I'm an active LinkedIn user. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, friend me up or whatever it's called, uh, connect up, and um, you can message me through that system. Um, and you know, you can go to carbonvert.com and, um, uh, we have contact information on there as well. So this is awesome. I appreciate you coming on and, uh, let's try to do it again. Maybe, uh, six, nine months out. I'm sure the world will look a little different then too. We'll have, we'll have new stories. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks Raj. Appreciate Thanks. it. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.